long introduction. I hope it was true. Uh, I'll have to trust, trust that. It, um, my wife and I are uh, thrilled uh, to be here. It is, um, it's a privilege for us to get to see uh, the church in other parts of the world. Uh, we're from Jackson, Mississippi. That's where we live right now. And um, this is a little bit of a different environment for us. And our hearts have been encouraged by seeing God's people um, embracing the gospel, wanting to learn, um, growing in faith. And so we're so thankful to be here. And it's an honor for me to uh, get to preach to you this morning. I have um, had the privilege of having Matthew in my classes the last couple of years, and it has been um, a blessing um, to my school and to me and to my family to have him uh, studying at Reformed Theological Seminary. So um, let's begin with prayer, and then let's talk about the gospel according to Joseph. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, give us eyes that see and ears that hear the good news of the gospel from your word, even in the Old Testament. Cause us to love you more, to love one another more, and to grow in grace as we hear your word preached. Help us to see Jesus in every aspect. In your son's name we pray, amen. Uh, the account of Joseph in the house of Potiphar is perhaps a well-known part of the Joseph narratives, Genesis 37 through 50. I think that's what you're working through right now. It's the account of the family or the genealogy of Jacob, and it's focusing primarily on two sons, Joseph and Judah. This family history is recorded for us in the Bible, and it has several related functions. So just as you're thinking about the Joseph narratives and what you're going to be doing over the next several weeks, there are several things that are going to help us understand this particular Joseph narrative, because most of us, I think, have been trained to think that... Um, Genesis chapter 39 is about uh, sexual temptation and resisting temptation. And of course, there's part of it there, but that's really not what the story is about. The story is about suffering even when you do the right thing. Suffering even when you do the right thing. Even when you resist temptation, you end up suffering. And so that's, that's kind of a problem for the Christian life because we think if we, if we uh, resist temptation and we do the right thing, then our life will go well. But according to Joseph, it gets worse for doing the right thing. So what are the Joseph narratives about? At one level, this narrative displays how God protects and provides for his people in the midst of suffering and hardship. So far, we have encountered a dysfunctional family, betrayal, deceit, death, incest, and a, hope, a host of other tragic realities, all of which are still common to us today. At another level, this narrative displays on a smaller scale of world history, that is Canaan and Egypt, the heavenly design of God, in, 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 or sorry, the, the larger heavenly design of God to extend His glory and grace to the ends of the earth. Okay, I'm just going to check my PowerPoint. Hold on. All right, there we go. <laughs> I want to make sure that's working. This is why the account of Judah is embedded in a narrative that is largely taken up with Joseph. The account of Joseph is a smaller type or an example of what God is planning to do through the seed of Judah. That is Jesus, the true and better Joseph. You'll remember perhaps from Genesis 12 and Genesis 15 that one of the promises that God made to Abraham was that through your family, Abraham, all the other families of the earth will be blessed. And this is the first example that we see of Abraham's family being a blessing to other nations. First, Joseph is a blessing to Potiphar and Egypt. Then he's a blessing to the prison. Then he blesses Egypt and the whole surrounding region by saving them from the famine. It's the beginning of the fulfillment of God's promises to the patriarchs. And lastly, the narrative is commonly recognized as a type of wisdom literature. The Joseph narratives uh, deal with very practical issues in life, like suffering and betrayal, and, and so it's often referred to by Old Testament scholars as wisdom literature. How do you think and live in light of God's world? Um, dealing with practical life issues such as sin and temptation, success and failure, suffering and providence. Biblical wisdom teaches us how to live in God's world according to God's word. It teaches us how life works best 
in a fallen and broken world. There are three basic facets to wisdom, and this will help us as we work through the Joseph narratives in this particular chapter. First is the recognition that God has created the world and that it works best according to the way he built it. If you want to know how something works, consult a designer. Right? If you want to know how the body works, consult a doctor. If you want to know how a building works, consult an engineer. If you want to know how all of life and reality works, consult the creator of all of life and reality. So wisdom literature is the fear of the Lord that enables you to understand how this world works from the perspective of the creator himself. But that's not the only thing that we know about wisdom literature. Wisdom literature, secondly, uh, takes into the account that, in fact, that we have wrecked this world with sin, and so we often find ourselves suffering. That is, God created a perfect world that worked perfectly for us, but then we sinned and broke the system, right? And so because of that, we're sinners and the world is under a curse, and so we suffer because things aren't how they should be. Things aren't how they should be. We, we now live in a little bit... Um, we now live in a foreign land a little bit. I feel it right here. Um, uh, whenever I travel, I go, you know, I, I, when I've, I've, I've been over to England and I've been to Brazil and I've been to Mexico, now up here to Canada, and even though there are many, many things that are similar, we have cars and chairs and people and buildings, you feel slightly out of place. You feel slight, and that's how we should feel in this world, no matter how comfortable we are, slightly out of place because it's, it's broken and we're broken and it doesn't always work uh, how it should. So we're slightly out of place. And third, um, uh, our sin does not thwart God's plan, program, our sovereignty. So the three things about wisdom is God knows how it works best. We're broken and we broke it, so we're going to suffer because it's, it's, slightly out of, you know, it's, it's slightly out of whack. And thirdly, that our sin and its brokenness uh, doesn't thwart God's plan at all. He's going to change. Here's the theme of the Joseph narratives. Are you ready? He's going to change that which was intended for evil, into that which is good for his people. Genesis 50, 20, and we'll get to that a little bit later. We are now in the third chapter of the account of Jacob's family presented in Genesis 37 to 50. In Genesis 37, Joseph, the 11th son of Jacob by Rachel, was identified as the favorite son and the primary heir to Jacob's household. The Lord gave him two different dreams, sheaves of wheat, then the sun, the moon, and the stars, and those got him in trouble. In the, um, in the response to the unfairness of uh, the favoritism and the dreams, right, his brothers betrayed him and, sold, and, sold, and wanted to kill him, but then ended up selling him into slavery down into Egypt. In Genesis 38, we encounter the difficult events of the life of Judah, leaving his brothers, living among the Canaanites, and the inclusion of Tamar, the Canaanite, woman in the royal line of the patriarchs. Now in Genesis 39, the account of Joseph in Egypt resumes. First, he's going to be a slave in the house of Potiphar. And then if you don't think it can get any worse, he's going to be a prisoner. Right? The only thing lower than a slave is a prisoner. Uh, it's double incarceration. From this text tonight, we will learn that, A, or first, the Lord was with Joseph. This is a theme that's going to run through the narrative uh, four times. In the text, it's going to say the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. And this is a problem because we think when the Lord is with us, we will prosper. But for Joseph, when the Lord is with him, he suffers. And why? And is that going to happen to us? Do we want the Lord with us? Secondly, the Lord prospered Joseph in the midst of that suffering. Three times it says that. And then interestingly, all of Joseph's um, prospering, and all of the fact that God was with him never benefited Joseph at all. It only benefited the people around him. That is, Joseph's suffering and his loss blessed the other people around him. He was a conduit of God's blessing through his suffering. Joseph lived a life of integrity, respected his employer, and resisted sin and temptation, and perhaps one of the most famous uh, resisting of temptation stories in the Bible. Given all this great stuff, we would expect to read an account of Joseph's life other than the one recorded here for us in Genesis 39. If the Lord was with Joseph and Joseph was obedient to the Lord, then why did he encounter uh, relentless temptation, false accusations, wrongful imprisonment, and then more betrayal and suffering? This does not, this does not sound 
like many of the books that I read in the modern Christian culture about Christian living, do the right thing so you can suffer more and bless other people. But it's in the Bible. This chapter has a lot to teach us about suffering in the Christian life. It's wisdom literature, much of which may undercut the way we normally even think about our own lives or about how God treats us. Maybe suffering could be a sign of God's love to us, not a sign of His displeasure in us. So let's look at the text uh, that we have for today. The text, as you know, falls into two basic parts, I think. I couldn't follow the reading, so I'm just going to guess that it does fall into two basic parts in English. Uh, there's first, there's Joseph is sold as a slave into the house of Potiphar, where he rises to power through exemplary service and then is betrayed by Potiphar's wife. Here, the text goes to great lengths to establish Joseph's innocence and integrity. Now, you'll notice in the text, for example, um, in chapter, in, um, uh, at the very beginning in the, in the verses, it's going to say twice that the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord is with Joseph. And you'll see uh, that in the woman's temptation and Potiphar's wife's temptation of Joseph, he, uh, she's going to say twice, lay with me, lay with me. So do you, do you see uh, the Lord is with Joseph, but she's saying, come away and be with me. Does that make sense? She's trying to pull Joseph away from the Lord. It's very much a picture of what we encounter in Proverbs 1 through 9, right? Where there's, there's, there's a young man being instructed in wisdom literature and there are two women Lady Wisdom and Lady Folly. And Lady Wisdom is saying, come away with me and live and be fruitful. And Lady Folly is saying, come away with me. I'm even better than Lady F Wisdom. And so you, you feel this here where this lady here, Lady Folly in the text, Potiphar's wife, is saying, come with me, come with me. But Joseph can't go with her because to go with her would be to abandon the Lord. Joseph calls it a great evil and a sin. Second, Joseph is given over as a prisoner into the house of incarceration, the round house, it's called in Hebrew, the house you can't escape from. It's, so you're just in a circle, in a circle, in a circle. You can't, you can't get out of it. That's the, how they called a prison in those days, where once again he rises to power through exemplary service and then later will be betrayed by two inmates who neglect to tell Pharaoh about him. So you get it? Betrayed by his brothers, betrayed by Potiphar's wife and even Potiphar, betrayed in the prison. In each case, though, you'll observe that Joseph's betrayals are leading him into greater and greater spheres of service and greater and greater influence. First, he's just uh, the servant in a household and eventually the chief servant in that household, a very respectable position. Then he serves in the state penitentiary or the state prison, which would be a larger kind of a state and sphere of influence. And he has, he has influence even over the king's officials. And then he'll be influencing over the entire kingdom He'll be second in command in Egypt and the surrounding region. So you can see each act of betrayal and each increase in suffering results in his greater and greater influence and in blessing larger and larger groups of people around him. So far, the life of Joseph has been presented as a life of suffering and betrayal, but not because he is bad or immoral. On the contrary, Joseph is blessed by God's presence and favor. He is successful in all that he does, and he is full of integrity, fleeing from sin and temptation. Uh, I have four children. I would love all of my children to um, have this kind of integrity and prosperity in life and be this kind of person, right? But I would never wish this kind of suffering on them at the same time. And so the question is, why do these, things, why do these two things get wrapped up together? Why, therefore, did Joseph suffer? Why was life so difficult, so unfair, for this favored son of the Father. Today we want to consider why we suffer, how we should suffer, and the hope of suffering. Why we should suffer, how we should suffer, and the hope of suffering. So first, why do we suffer? It's an important question uh, to ask, and it's a huge question in life, right? Why do we suffer? And I have no intention or even the ability to answer that question fully. You'll have to ask Matthew that question, right? Go see him in his counseling office. Uh, rather, I'm just going to address the issue presented in our text and see what that leads us to. Why does Joseph suffer? And so we'll just talk about maybe one slice or two slices of suffering in life, and there are going to be many, many more slices to encounter. Certainly, first, uh, we, we all suffer uh, because of our own sin. We all suffer because of our own sin, Right? If we smash our hand with a hammer, we will suffer the pain of that foolish act. We, sin, we suffer because we sin. 
and the Bible are full of examples of people suffering for their sin, right? Uh, Israel worshiped the golden calf, and they suffered because of that. Moses struck the rock a second time in Numbers 20, and he was forbidden from entering the promised land, and he suffered for what he did. Achan in the book of Joshua, David and Bathsheba when they committed their sin, Solomon and his wives, the Bible is clear that sin produces suffering. There is no shortage of biblical examples for suffering and sin. And we often think that's true because we're accustomed to thinking about our sin has consequences, and it certainly does. But what about people like Joseph or Abel or Noah or Job or Hannah or Ruth or Daniel or Esther? This is the other side of the coin. These people are presented in Scripture because they suffer, but they didn't sin in order, to, in order to earn that suffering or in order to feel the weight of those consequences. They suffered because they were good people and doing the right thing. And the Bible wants to be clear that there are different kinds of suffering. Sometimes we, we, we inflict our own suffering on ourselves by foolish actions, sin, but other times we do the right thing and we still suffer. And maybe that's the tougher question for us to deal with in life. We feel like, you know, in some sense, if I do something wrong, okay, I did something wrong. Uh, that, has, that has negative consequences. But if that's true, if I do something right, shouldn't that have positive consequences? And when it doesn't, that maybe causes us to despair unless we can think biblically about suffering for doing the right thing. This type of suffering, I find, is often neglected in our day, especially in kind of the health and wealth of the prosperity gospel movement. I don't know if that's uh, present up here at all, as it is uh, down south, especially uh, right next to us in Texas. There's a big church there, and it's all about this kind of business that if you do the right thing and you think the right thoughts, your life will be, you know, butterflies, rainbows, and unicorns forever. Nothing negative, right? Uh, but, e but even this is, is really just kind of a, a manifestation of how we really think in our hearts about it, right? We, there's something in our hearts that say, like, if I do the right thing, God will bless me. If I do the right thing, God will bless me. And if I'm not, if I'm not uh, being blessed right now, I must be doing something wrong. God must be displeased with me. And I want to change your minds about that this morning. So why is there suffering of this type? Why do the righteous suffer? It's a big theme in Job. It's a big theme in Proverbs. Why do the righteous suffer? There's a lot we could say about it, but because of time, we're just going to pick an angle or two. The answer from the text comes from the larger context of the Joseph narrative. So whenever you're reading one of these chapters and one of these narratives or accounts in the Joseph narrative, you've got to think about what God's doing in this whole big complex of Joseph narratives. So what's, what's the end game? right? When you read the book of Job, right, you know at the end, Job is vindicated. He gets everything back and double and triple, and it's going to be okay, right? What about with Joseph, right? We know that the Lord is working to save his people and the world from death by a terrible upcoming famine, right? We know kind of in our mind what's happening, and he is positioning Joseph as the means to deliverance from this calamity, right? Joseph is going to be the, 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 the savior of the world, if you will, and the way he's going to save the world is through suffering. Thus, Joseph's suffering is ultimately temporary, and that helps us read the story, right? Uh, and for the greater uh, good of his family and the world. So, so what so many in the narrative, so, so what so many people in this narrative intend for evil for Joseph, God is going to make into good. Genesis 50, 20. Genesis 50, 20. Genesis 50, 20. That's the, that's the kind of the the, the heartbeat or the spinal cord or the, 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 the foundation that runs through this narrative from Genesis 37 to Genesis 50, you've got to read it all like this. What, God, or what, what man is intending for evil, God is intending for good to save many, to save many. And that is hope in the midst of suffering. Now, at the time, Joseph did not know what God was he was suffering, but he did not know why. So we have to feel that weight with Joseph. Perhaps you feel that weight when you're suffering and you don't know why. It was not until much later that he'd be able to look back and understand or even comprehend the grace of God in his suffering. So sometimes we will suffer in life because God is at work to do something beyond our current comprehension. Right? It's the classic uh, when you tell your kids you're disciplining them, right? You'll understand later in life. 
that the parents, get, the parents lay out, and your kids never believe you, but then one day they may come back and say, you were right, that was really good for me that you disciplined me in that way, right? Uh, it was good to suffer. And so we, we, we fail sometimes. We still act like children. We fail to understand that God, the creator of the universe, knows what he's doing with us. And he knows when you're suffering, and he knows why you're suffering, and he promises that he's doing it ultimately for your good. And that's comfort in the midst of suffering. So by way of suffering, we suffer because of our sin. Uh, we, we, we also suffer because we live in a fallen and broken world that we broke. But we also suffer because God is at work in us and in this world to do something greater than we might currently understand or recognize. One day we will look back and understand and we will say with Joseph, together in the resurrection, what this world meant for evil against us, God has meant for our ultimate good. Now, since we suffer, how does the Bible teach us to endure it and to persevere in faith? Is this the right slide? Okay. <laughs> I lost my uh, English translation. Oh, there they are. Okay, very good. I'm one, I'm one behind, but that's okay, right? Uh, people, from, people from the U.S. are a little slow. Okay? Okay. Now, since we suffer, how does the Bible teach us to endure it and to persevere in faith? Now, remember your context. When Joseph suffers in the narrative, we're not too worried because we know that he will soon be vindicated, that his suffering will cease, and that everything will turn out for the best. I mean, it's going to be great. His life is going to be great, Right? He's going to be the second in command of, of Egypt. He'll have influence and wealth and power. He'll have a growing family and all of his uh, immediate family around him. He'll be caring for them all. The dreams of Genesis 37 will come true by Genesis 50. The same reality, however, exists in the Christian life for us. We all know that our temporary earthly suffering will be turned into eternal, new, heaven and earth joy. We know that Jesus will vindicate us he will fix the world we broke, destroy evil and sin, and wipe away every tear of suffering from our eyes. Revelation 21, he'll wipe away every tear. Not just every tear that we're crying at that moment because we're so happy that the new heavens and earth has arrived, but every tear we've ever, ever wept. It says in the prophets, the Lord keeps those tears, counts them up in a bottle for the last day. He knows every tear you've ever shed in suffering. So in the midst of our own temporary earthly suffering, Remember the end from the beginning that God is working all things for our good, even in our suffering. So we have these uh, Genesis 50, 20, Jeremiah 29, 11, and Romans 8, 28 are all kind of these uh, mottos, and they're not cliches. They're not cliches, right? In Genesis, in Genesis 50, right, uh, you intended evil against me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives, Right? That, you know, uh, Jeremiah picks up on that same kind of text here in, in, um, in, in, in his um, prophecy where he says, uh, for I know the plans I have, for, the Lord says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And that may sound like a prosperity cliche, but I want to tell you that Jeremiah was speaking to exiles in Egypt who were suffering, right? They weren't living in Shawinigan, they were living in Jackson, Mississippi. Does that make sense? And he said, still, I have a good plan for you. you believe it. Believe it. Okay? Or the famous one, Romans 8, 28, right? And we know, we know, we have confidence that in all things, not some things or even most things, but in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And Paul's writing this, you know, from jail. You know, uh, he's, in, in, he's in Rome, he's in jail. That's his life in Rome. And he's saying all these things are working out for good. He's suffering. Suffering. So how do we train ourselves to think and to live this way? Right? It's one thing to have it in our brain, but how do we, how do we, what are the biblical resources for changing how we interact with our own suffering? We have biblical resources. We have biblical resources. Suffering is such a big problem in the Bible and in life that God in his infinite wisdom has devoted a very large portion of Scripture to suffering and, the, and the, the issues related to suffering. First, 
we have um, accounts of the people like Joseph or Daniel or Esther or Job who suffered for the sake of God's kingdom. They were protected and delivered by God and persevered to the end. God has taught us about suffering from these men and women. And the Bible invites you to read them, right, and to understand uh, how these verses work by illustrating them with people like Job and Esther and Daniel, saying, see, the Lord can be trusted. The Lord can be trusted. The Lord can be trusted. Look at the life of Joseph. Look at the life of Job. These people suffered, but for a reason, and God vindicated them. Second, in addition to the many examples we have or the narratives that kind of form pictures in our brain that allow us to kind of grasp onto uh, the Bible, there are, are, there are books uh, that teach large amounts or large portions of, of the text teach about how to suffer. So Job teaches us how to suffer. Uh, and you can see his friends dialoguing with this very issue like, Job, you're suffering. You may have sinned. Confess your sin and you won't suffer. But we know from the beginning Job was a righteous man and didn't suffer. He was suffering to vindicate God, right? Lamentations, the fall of Israel, or the fall of Jerusalem, where uh, the prophet is uh, crying over the loss of God's kingdom on this earth and thinking, is your plan over? Is your plan over? And, and, and so he gives you his plan. How do you, how do you deal with suffering? You wait and you hope because the Lord is going to restore all things. You wait and you hope. That's how you endure suffering. You wait and you hope because you're still trusting in God's promise. And his ultimate promise wasn't a, a bunch of dusty old land in Israel. It was a new heavens and new earth. So the dusty old land in Israel had to perish so that the new heavens and new earth could come. Think of Daniel. Daniel Daniel's a great example uh, in terms of uh, education on uh, suffering. Uh, Daniel at the very end, you know, Daniel has been in exile in Babylon, basically running the country that destroyed his own country uh, for some 70 years, right? At the very end of his life, Daniel says, I am super tired of this stuff. And man, I just want to go home. And here's what the Lord says, die in Babylon, get resurrected later, and that's when I'll fix all things. The end, from the beginning. God said, hey, don't worry about it. I've got you covered you're going to go home one day, but you're a true home. So, uh, uh, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, and uh, the book of Psalms, even the book of Hebrews has a lot to say about suffering. We'll get to that at the end. And the book of Revelation, in fact, the book of Revelation was written to encourage Christians who are suffering, right? To encourage Christians who are suffering. Um, that, uh, literature like um, uh, Revelation or like a, a Ezekiel or parts of Daniel where you have all these fantastic beasts and wild things and uh, crazy pictures and images uh, were, were written to comfort you, to remind you that uh, the kingdoms of this world uh, are, are hideous and large and powerful, but God is over all those things. And so he's showing you in like, in like a Godzilla, King Kong movie style that he's going to win, that he's going to win. Now, the book of Psalms has a very particular um, helpful um, reality in it. Um, the number one type of psalm in the book of Psalms is a lament. It's interesting that in God's hymnal, if you will, God's songbook, uh, the most common song in the book of Psalms, uh, the, the book of Psalms is a lament. That is, how, how do you deal with suffering? How do you deal with suffering? Because suffering is really, um, suffering is really th this reality, living between God's promise and the fulfillment of that promise, right? You know the hope that's coming and you look at your own life and say, boy, it's not here yet. And so you, you feel the weight of those unfulfilled promises. So the book of Psalms gives us a great, um, a great resource and it can be a means of training your heart to deal with suffering. Um, and it, uh, um, it's going to be a little bit difficult to translate this into French, I think, because in English there is this... Um, little acrostic here um, that um, is uh, the lament structure. The, the lament psalms in the book of Psalms have a six-part structure to them, and they're intended to um, help you process uh, suffering and grief in such a way that you put your hope in God again. Why so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. How? Sing a lament psalm. That's the motto. And in English, um, in English, the little acrostic is act sad, which means to lament, you know, to be sad. Um, in, in, uh, in French, it's C-C-C-A-A-A. -A -A. Uh, I don't know what that means, okay? Uh, 
Um, but I'll give you the six parts, and maybe someone uh, brilliant in here can figure out how that might be act sad in, in um thing. But what you act sad, so A, is you um, call out to God. You address God. You call out to God. Address God. C is you, um, you complain or you issue a complaint. You tell God exactly how you feel. You hold nothing back. He already knows what's in your wicked heart. So you can't even say anything that would catch him off guard or offend him. So you might as well just be honest and say it. It is cathartic. It feels good when you can trust that God can handle your grief. T, you trust. You express your trust in God despite the pain and the uncertainty of suffering. There is this promise in your brain that you're going to say, I'm going to cling on to it. That what this world intends for evil, God will intend for good. Then there's the salvation or deliverance. You remember God's saving works and His promise and pledge to save you. So you remember the life of Joseph. You remember the life of Daniel. You remember the life of Moses. Of all these people who suffered that God was faithful to, and you know that because you're in His kingdom, you'll be treated like these people too. That what this world intended for evil, God will intend for good. After you do the A and the C and the T, the address, the complaint, the trust, and you talk about salvation and deliverance, then there's assurance. In light of God's past promises and faithfulness to His people, we can be certain then that He will deliver us from His suffering. And you express that verbally, that even though it's hard to believe it, I'm going to say I'm going to cling on to it. Even though I don't feel it right now, I'm going to say it with my brain so that my brain can push it down into my heart. And then declarative praise. You finish with praise in the midst of suffering, like Job did. God is worthy of the praise, and He has made known to you the end from the beginning, that He will always be there with you, like Joseph. Remember, God is with you in your suffering. A, a sample of this, and I didn't print it out um, for the, the board, is Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Now, if you remember, Psalm 22 is the one that Jesus quoted while He was on the cross. My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? And when Jesus quotes the opening line of that, he's not just quoting the opening line. It's like a song title. He's saying, remember this whole song, right? Remember this whole song. Like when I say to you something like maybe Amazing Grace, right? You can think of like the whole song and all that it means to you or something like that. It's the same thing Jesus is saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's, he's, uh, he's, he's suffering for doing the right thing in order that he might bring salvation to the world and how does Jesus cope with his suffering? He sings a song, song uh, Psalm 22. Listen to the address and the complaint here that the psalmist says in the midst of his suffering. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why does it feel like you're so far from saving me? So far from the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer me by night, and I am not silent. See, he feels like even though God has promised to be with him, God is distant from him, and so he cries out to God and complains that God's not really there. Do you remember um, in the book of Judges, in the, in the Gideon narratives, the angel of the Lord shows up to Gideon and says, uh, the Lord is with you, man of war. And, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, and, and Gideon says, hey, if the Lord's with us, why are we suffering? He didn't get it. If the Lord's with us, why are we saying? And then the angel just ignores him and moves on, right? Uh, and uh, says, don't worry, I'm going to save you from the suffering. What these people, these Amorites are uh, uh, intending for evil, I'm going to intend for good for my people. Trust and deliverance, verses 3 through 5 in Psalm 22. You are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you our fathers put their trust. You see, he's remembering the past. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you, and they were saved. In you they trusted, and they were not disappointed. So they're remembering God's saving acts in the past to, imply those to, their own, to apply those to their own lives. Assurance and declarative praise. I will declare your name to my brothers. In the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise Him. All you descendants of Jacob, interesting for our text, uh, 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 honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from you, but he has listened to your cry for help, even though he seems like he's far from you. He's heard your cry. The poor will eat and be satisfied. 
They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. That's just one example of some 70 lament psalms in the book of Psalms. You can't read this altar or the book of Psalms without encountering uh, these expressions of grief and hope and joy and how they're all mixed together. They're intended uh, to train or to school your heart. So what then is the hope of suffering? If we have the, if we have the why do we suffer and the how do we suffer, then how can we move into the hope of suffering? What's the hope of suffering specifically? What is the hope of suffering or, what, or where is the power to really endure suffering? Does that make sense? Uh, consider uh, what seems like an impossible New Testament commandment for suffering and hardship from James 1-2. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Why? Now listen, consider it all joy or pure joy. Okay? It's hard to suffer. It's probably even harder to suffer and consider it pure joy in the midst of that suffering. So we want to know what the secret is. Verse 3 in James 1, Because you know, because you know, that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be uh, mature and complete, lacking in nothing. God is trying to make you rich in your suffering so that you lack nothing. For the Christian, suffering is something that God uses to help us grow in our faith, to mature. It's like working out your muscles, right? You do not get stronger, right? You do not get stronger by doing what's easy for your muscles. Does that make sense? You have to go to the gym and cause your muscles to suffer to get stronger so you won't be lacking in strength. Suffering in the Christian life is like spiritual exercise, right? It's hard, and it helps us to be fitter spiritually. That's the grace of it. That's the grace of it. Let's consider uh, uh, what Hebrews 12 then has to say about suffering. And what's interesting about Hebrews 12, right, is Hebrews 12 comes on the tail of Hebrews 11, of course, numerically. But Hebrews 11 is just rehearsing the history of God's people and all their suffering. And you remember at the very end, it talks about the judges who I have kind of a, a, a real appreciation and fondness for. And I think you've heard judges in here recently. Um, and so what does it say about them? They were uh, torn in two, killed, uh, had to hide in caves, all, and they, they suffered. And so what was the secret of their suffering? What allowed the judges to live by faith in the midst of those terrible times that they lived in? Hebrews 12 tells us, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses from the Old Testament people you remember, let us then throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And I would say the sin would be something like despair in suffering. Not suffering, but the despair in suffering. With perseverance, uh, let us, and let us run, like Joseph ran or fled, right? Let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, suffered. He endured the cross, he scorned its shame, and then he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, that is Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The first key to suffering with joy then, according to Hebrews 12, is to fix your eyes on Jesus, the true and better Joseph, who was innocent, falsely accused, resisted all temptation, lived the perfect life, but was abandoned and handed over by his brothers to suffer punishment, uh, incarceration, uh, uh, betrayal. He was handed over to be punished on our behalf because we were the joy set before him. You see, even Jesus, when he suffered, he knew the end from the beginning that his suffering would get something that was set before him, us. Jesus came to earth as a man and suffered in the same way that we have to suffer for something greater and beyond what we currently have now. Jesus suffered for the joy set before him, and the joy was the getting of his people, us. You 
were the joy set before him. You were what enabled Jesus to suffer on the cross. When he saw your faces on the cross, that was the joy set before him. We were his joy, his focus or his compass in the midst of suffering. In the midst of his suffering, it was us that he was looking towards. It is the God who suffered with joy for us that enables us to suffer with joy in this world for a little while. But there's still more even in the book of Hebrews that's helpful. I'm going to pick up in verse 4. In your struggle against sin, in your suffering, you have not resist, resisted yet to the point of shedding your blood like Jesus did. You have forgotten uh, that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son or daughter, do not make light of the Lord's discipline or your suffering, and do not lo lose heart when the Lord even rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines, listen to this, those he loves. And he punishes everyone he accepts as a son or a daughter. Endure hardship as discipline then because God is treating you as sons and daughters. Consider what this is saying, saying. Because Jesus suffered on our behalf and for our sins, our suffering is never, ever, ever because of God's displeasure in us which is what we usually think when we're suffering, that God must be displeased with us. Rather, our suffering, according to the Bible, is because God loves us when we suffer for doing the right thing. When we, because God loves us. We're his favored sons and daughters. And he's causing us to suffer to produce holiness and righteousness and peace in our lives. So that the Bible says we lack, so that we lack nothing. So that we lack nothing. This is true spiritual fitness. And so our suffering is a suffering with a purpose because we are made more and more into the image of Jesus when we suffer. Our suffering is a suffering of sonship, reminding us that God loves us as his true and genuine children. Remember that. When you suffer, it's a mark of God's love for you, of your true and genuine adoption into his family. And finally, when you suffer, you suffer because Jesus, or finally, um, our suffering is a suffering of hope because Jesus suffered for us and now becomes the center and source of joy in the midst of our suffering because he has turned our fear of condemnation and rejection into the discipline of transformation and fellowship. And let me put it this way as I conclude. Um, the true secret to suffering is knowing that God will be faithful to his promises in the end. That what this world means for evil, what Satan meant for evil, even what your own sin created as evil in your life, God will turn into good. He will redeem it. He will change it. He will cash it in for that which is good in your life, ultimately for your glorification so that you lack nothing. In order to prove that to you, he did for you in a really special way what he did for Joseph in a smaller way. The key to the Joseph narrative in Genesis 39, what gets him into trouble, what causes him to suffer, and what helps him to endure in suffering, and even what helps him to prosper and to bless all those people around him, is that God was with him. Was that God was with him. And God was with Joseph in a special way, and we also have the same special way and even a more special way, that the God who was with Joseph in Egypt was with us in, in the incarnation, right? He was the true and better Joseph, the Emmanuel, the God with us fulfilled. In real space and time, the God who was with Joseph came to this earth to be with us. And he experienced betrayal and suffering for doing all the right things, even well beyond Joseph, unto death, Right? But we don't see the story ending with his death, do we? We see it ending with his resurrection and his ascension where he sits at the right hand of God the Father right now and waits to bring us home. God with us. Jesus is the, the living embodiment of God's faithfulness to his own promises that, that our suffering will ultimately result in our good because he sent his son to suffer in our place. And we see how that resulted in the son's glorification and ascension to the father. One day, we will sit 
with Jesus in heaven around that throne where all that this world meant for good, God has changed into incredibly great satisfaction so that you will lack nothing ever again. Full satisfaction forever. The good news of the gospel is that the suffering that we experience now has been taken upon, the suffering of disobedience has been taken upon Jesus so that we might have the suffering of sonship and that that sonship may endure forever in the new heavens and the new earth because God is with us. Even now in Jesus Christ, when he leaves, he says, Behold, I am with you always, even until the ends of the earth, when he will return to get us and take us home, and we will be with him forever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, there is no making light of suffering, and it seems like there's no way to erase it from our memories. It's a part of us forever. Uh, my guess is that many of us in this room right now are suffering in ways that only you know. Father, we ask that you would speak um, in our hearts uh, through your word to this suffering, that we would learn uh, to train our hearts to hope in you, to fully confess that what this world means for evil, you are meaning for our good, that we might lack nothing. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who came and was with us and embodied all that is good in suffering so that we might have the hope of glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.